Welcome, everyone. This is Eric Glazer, and welcome to our live recording of Bright Spots in Healthcare, produced by Shared Purpose Connect. Each episode, we bring leaders together to not only inform you, but also unearth bright spots, successes at health plans, hospitals, and other healthcare related organizations around our nation. We believe that this approach of finding bright spots and allowing you to observe them and decide if they should be applied at your organization and potentially cloning them is the most effective way of improving healthcare in our lifetime. Our topic today, oh, actually, before I forget, if you're on LinkedIn, and I know a lot of you are, we have a growing uh, LinkedIn page, Bright Spots in Healthcare, type it into your LinkedIn page. We post all of our episodes there. And we also post clips from each from shows. So you get like little sound bites from some of the experts. You don't have to listen to me. That's the good news. But you get sound bites, uh, video sound bites of some of our experts uh, answering questions. It's a great resource for all of you. So please follow that page if you want more content from us. And also for the full shows, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel if you like video or if you prefer to just listen to audio while you're in the car or walking around the airport or wherever you may be when you listen to podcasts. Please go to wherever you consume shows, Apple, Google Play, Spotify, wherever. Type in Bright Spots in Healthcare and please subscribe. And, and if you do like our content, if you give us a five-star rating, put a comment in. It does help more people follow us and it helps us grow the show. Our topic for today is Beyond Medicaid and Adherence, Unleashing the Power of Member Engagement to Elevate Outcomes. First, our partner and collaborator for today's episode is our latest member of our signature partner sponsors, Scene Health. We are super excited to be working with them. They are a medication engagement company that's taking on this colossal half trillion dollar problem of medication not adherence. And here's the twist, okay? They're doing it in a very novel way that's raising the bar on directly observed therapy by using asynchronous video engagement. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them later on in the episode. But if I piqued your interest and you can't wait, check out scene.health, super cool URL, by the way, scene.health to learn more about what they can do for your organization. Our esteemed panel today, we're going to hold back introductions, formal introductions, if you will, with full bios, uh, because we don't have time, as we often and always do. My producer, Sherry Keels, is going to post a link in your chat if you're attending live. And if you're just listening uh, on your podcast app, it'll be in the description of the show, a link to their full bios of this great panel so you can get a sense of the expertise you are about to benefit from. I will introduce their name, title, and affiliation right now very quickly. Tom Minetti, he's the Associate Vice President of Quality Products at CareSource. Molly McGraw, PharmD, by the way, Manager of Clinical Pharmacy at UPMC Health Plan, five-star health plan, by the way, props to you guys. And Suzanne Moxham, Director of Quality Accreditation and Government Programs at Care First. And last and certainly not least, co founder and CEO of Scene Health, Sebastian Sager. So thank you all for being here. I want to kind of, I'm going to direct the conversation. We're going to start with some tactics. I want to hear about some of the exciting tactics you guys are deploying successfully. Uh, tactical bright spots are always really, could be really useful for all of our listeners. And then we're going to raise, raise it up a little bit and talk a little bit about strategy. And, and then we may come back down towards the end and cover a few more tactics at the end. So I want to start with refills. I know it feels like a tired topic, uh, but it's actually one that I know has a lot of complexity tied to it, especially when we're rethinking how the pharmacy benefit uh, is delivered and what the pharmacy benefit is for your members and how it's connected with your overall strategy. So I'm going to start with Suzanne, uh, Suzanne Moxham, who's the Director of Quality Accreditation Director of Quality Accreditation and Government Programs at Care First. Suzanne, how is Care First thinking about refills? So we have um, a, a lot of outreach and efforts around coordinating refills. Um, it starts with uh, mining our CVS, our we use CVS as our PBM, our, our, our data on pharmacy fills. And we coordinate uh, refill coordination when needed. So we're looking to assist the pharmacy and the provider with making sure that those refills get prompted to be filled. Um, if we have someone who is um, a provider who's prescribing at 30 days, 
We also work very diligently to convert 30-day prescriptions to 90-day or even 100-day. We have you know, some lines of business where they've expanded out to cover medications for 100 days. Um, so obviously, that's pretty basic thinking that if we can um, decrease the amount of time someone has to go retrieve their medications, they're going to be more likely to take their medications that they have on hand. So it's a simple concept but it's gone a long way. Um, we've done a lot of education with our providers since um, in that Medicaid space, they were not used to per, per our coverage for 90 day fills. So we did a lot of uh, education. We have the pharmacists also doing education for us and, and reaching back out to prescribers because the plan does prefer 90 day fills. Um, and with doing this work, we have uh, you know one, FTE working on this, and we've seen year to date uh, or year over year about five percentage points of improvement in our statin adherence measures that we track very closely. Um, and so it's it's definitely one that has a uh, it's easy to produce uh, results if you go after the right people, right? So so I understand maybe how you could target medications based upon your member data, how are you, are you also targeting the providers too who may not have the prescription behavior down? Sure, so we do reach back out to those prescribers. And like I said, we are, are re-educating them and, and doing more focused education with them on the needs, um, you know, especially uh, when they, uh, some, some will continue to not want to prescribe at a 90 day. And we accept that. So once we know that that's not their preference, it's more about they want the patient to come back in to be seen. We understand that. But there are others that are willing to just change prescribing practices um, based on getting the medications to the members. Yeah, you know, I'd be interested. I, I don't know, Sherry, if you could pull this off. <clears throat> Sherry Kiel's my producer behind the scenes. She's going to love me for this. I wonder if we could put up a poll about how many of our listeners who are watching live right now are working to convert from 30 days to 90 or more. Uh, if you could do that, Sherry, if you can't, let me know, but we'll try to put that up there so we can get a gauge of what our audience is working on. You know, Suzanne, before I let you go here off, uh, off the hot seat, can you share a little bit about the results uh, of this program so far? Sure, so uh, we have been extremely successful. Like I said, we had statistically significant improvement year over year with implementing this. Um, throughout 2023. We started, uh, I mean, sorry, with throughout 2022. We onboarded somebody late in 2021. And like I said, we tracked those measures and, and worked through that process and, and saw 5% on average between the adherence measures, about 5% improvement year over year. That's great. And, and, and did you have to pour a lot of resources into that? Like, how did you get no, it? No, yeah, it was one resource. Um, well, we started with a, a, an a, uh, well, one resource, a, a nurse who is working to review the data and, and send those refills and reaching out to providers and pharmacies. And so it, it is manageable. It's an, about a 90,000 member plan and about 5,000 members in those measures that we are working on. So I would say it's a, it's a high yield for one person um, to be able to deliver results like that quickly. Great stuff. I, I like that a lot. You know, let's, you, you mentioned the pharmacist, so I want to switch over and talk about the pharmacist. And and, and I'm going to bring in uh, Molly McGraw, clinical, manager of clinical pharmacy at UPMC Health Plan in Pittsburgh. How are you guys leveraging the pharmacist, Molly? So we leverage pharmacists across many health plan programs and initiatives. Um, our care management pharmacist team is a dedicated team of 20 plus pharmacists that we have that provides support to and interact with our members on a daily basis through various clinical programs that we offer, including chronic condition management, transitions of care, medication reconciliation, obviously medication adherence programs and other quality initiatives um, that we run daily. Um, and with these programs, Anywhere where a pharmacist is embedded in these programs, our outcomes have shown really amazing results in terms of improving medication adherence, medication use, while also helping to decrease medical costs and total cost of care. Um, however, we, we do know this foundation works. 
but we're always striving to increase access for our members and increase engagement um, to really be able to, to connect with them and provide member-centered care. And one of the one example of how we've been able to accomplish that is through our Ask a Pharmacist program. An Ask a Pharmacist is a part of our larger health plan telehealth platform. It essentially functions like a virtual provider practice. You know, we've all used virtual providers, whether it's urgent care, that sort of thing. So this setup is, is very similar. The platform allows members to come to us, to come to our team when they identify issues or if they have questions, you know, they're starting on a new medication, but they're hesitant. They can schedule a time to connect with our pharmacist in a telehealth manner. Um, and they can atyp typically obtain an appointment with a pharmacist on our team within 15 minutes uh, prior to a desired time that works for them. Um, in addition, you know, our pharmacists are connecting with members daily telephonically. They have the opportunity to connect and transition that member to a telehealth video call by sending an on-demand link to their mobile phone. Um, you know, it's oftentimes we're talking to these members, they're confused about their medications, they've got their bottles handy. Why not convert that to a telehealth appointment and get a more engaged, comprehensive visit completed with that member? Um, I can say typical discussions that we've had where members want to come to us and talk to us are, are what you would expect. You know, their doctor prescribed a new medication. They talk to the provider, but it's nice to have that pharmacist layer to say, hey, these are, these are the med medication experts. Let me hear what they have to say about this new medication. Um, they're concerned about side effects, that sort of thing. We can alleviate some of that additional stress. Um, oftentimes they come to us for help and guidance for their chronic disease states like diabetes, for example. We can talk to them, go over the medications that they're on to maintain that diagnosis or disease state and get them to optimal health outcomes. Um, lastly, a lot of coordination of care um, is being done through this environment, this modality. Patients have trouble getting to the pharmacy. What can we do to connect them? So we have resources to be able to put them in place with high-touch pharmacies, medication synchronization, obviously converting 90-day prescriptions, as Suzanne already commented on, um, and, and free delivery services. So really trying to connect them to care in a more comprehensive manner. And this face-to-face -face virtual engagement has really proved to be effective. Member, we're seeing repeat members sign up for appointments, uh, recognizing pharmacist names and, and member names and really creating that, that relationship has, has really helped and been beneficial for us. So key metrics, the, the appointment numbers monthly, are you tracking other things like the secondary results? Do you just list them out, the key metrics that you're looking for? Correct. Yes. Obviously, we, we want to make sure we're, we're growing and we're seeing increased volume from month to month from all of our lines of business that we have here at the health plan. You know, so looking at that commercial member mix, looking at the Medicaid, looking at Medicare to make sure that our marketing efforts are are strong in terms of promotion of this service. Um, so, yes, looking at volume, looking at, you know, ability to schedule with a pharmacist easily, making sure availability is set from a team perspective. Um, one call resolution. So our pharmacists complete assessments post call and we see how many health plan referrals were we able to, to get from this member connection. Those sorts of things are all tracked. That's great. Great. Uh, you know, I didn't, I love when the audience helps me moderate. Uh, it makes my job a lot easier. I didn't promote the Q&A module because I know how tight we are on time, folks, but there are a couple of good questions. So I, I want to jump into a follow-up for you, Molly. Are you able to build these as telehealth visits with the C with any CPT code or, or no? No, we do not at this time. Okay. So uh, I'm going to transition now because we've talked now about refills and now we're talking about sort of the pharmacist engagement. And so one of our listeners right now threw in this question, which is right on cue. Uh, she says, when I did home visits, I saw lots of individuals with bags of unopened prescription meds that just kept on getting delivered on autofill. How do we ensure uh, if we're going to move to an autofill or 90 day that we're actually, this is leading to true adherence and not just delivery of meds to a patient. So I'm going to ring in because this question 
I was getting ready to ask something similar uh, to Sebastian Sager, who's the CEO at Scene Health. How do we know members are actually taking the medication, Sebastian? Yes, well, um, we did talk about adherence in the context of refilling just now, like, like you mentioned, and obviously um, nobody's going to take medications that they don't yet have. So it's it's critical to to get the, the, the refills in for sure. And then taking medications are totally, it's a different matter, right? Some of the things that Molly was bringing up are, are really critical. Is this medication working for the patient? Are the dosages correct? Um, but if, if you really want to understand on a day-to-day -day basis, is somebody taking it, taking a medication, taking an inhaler, taking it properly, um, one approach is directly observed therapy. So that's the known as the gold standard for really understanding, is somebody actually taking the medication on a daily basis? It is standard of care actually inpatient. All doses are done under DOT. In the outpatient setting, it's been limited in the past, but this is like a this is like a 50 year old process, right? In the, at least in the public health domain, it's a community-based approach, people coming to people's homes, observing those bags of medication that have, you know, have not been taken, which are a problem because people get confused as to what they're, what they're actually taking. Um, and, and health plans are picking this up now, actually. So there are many health plans now um, using directly observed therapy for high, you know, high, highly vulnerable populations, chronic conditions, infectious conditions, um, for example, health large national health plan um, with a plan in Texas is using it for patients with diabetes. Why? Well, when you take your medications, um, you can reduce A1C pretty quickly. Um, so, of course, like the, it begs the question: Well, how is that? How is that possible? Because how do you do these visits um, at scale? And so, recently in the last ten years, directly observed therapy has been delivered using using video not just live video, but video recordings back and forth. Um, and I think the adoption is, is being driven now by the fact that the CDC actually recognized the, um, both the, the live video, but also a recorded video session back and forth. So the patient records themselves, care team responds back. In March, they recognized that as equivalent to an in-person visit. So I think a lot of modalities are, are opened up here um, through technology. And um, I think for, for chronic conditions, DOT is a, is a great strategy for some patients. I love that. And I know we'll get into results in a little bit, but um, I think you guys, one of the things that you guys gave me in preparation for the call today was a, uh, was a paper, I know it's sort of a scene health branded paper, but you actually go into details on a couple of case studies, which I thought were really interesting. And I think including this one, because this one does look familiar from what I read. And it brings some of these case studies to life and also shows the journals that these studies have been reviewed and published in on how medication engagement just revitalizes not only adherence, but overall your DOT and engagement strategies in general. So uh, what I'd like to do for folks is if they want a copy of that, uh, rather than have to find it on the scene website or go through a gate, uh, I'd like to send it to you directly after the show if you want it, only if you want it. But it's a, it's actually interesting and a good sort of extension of what Sebastian just said. So if you want a copy of that content piece, uh, I will email it to you after the show. Just click yes on the, uh, on the survey and uh, we'll send it right out to you. Uh, incidentally, folks, as far as feedback for me and Sherry and my entire team, we put these shows on if you're new to us every, typically every Thursday live. Uh, we love your feedback on content we should be covering, topics we should cover, and also how we could be better. Uh, so uh, we'll, have, we'll be sending a survey out in about uh, 25 minutes, quarter, quarter past, quarter to the hour. So you could take a two, three minutes of multiple choice survey monkey uh, and tell us what we could do better. I really would appreciate it. I, I want to shift a little bit now to strategy and let's start talking bigger picture. I'm going to bring in Tom Minetti, Associate Vice President of Quality Products at CareSource. Tom, how is CareSource thinking about adherence in the context of your overall value-based care strategy? Thank you, Eric. And, you know, when we think about value-based care, right, um, we really think about the member and how we can really surround the member with support. And a lot of the members that we go through, they're disadvantaged. Um, they, um, one of the biggest struggles is not being able to pay for their drugs. 
that's probably one of the biggest struggles. We call them up, they're on tier two, tier three, and it's an expensive diabetes drug. So um, when we think of med adherence, it's a team sport. And one of the team members that we didn't expect is CMS. CMS is actually a player in this too. So there is something called VBIN, Value-Based Insurance Design Model. And we were able to do a lot of innovations around drug benefits. As an example, for our DSNP members, because a lot of these are very specific, they, um, they are disadvantaged for this very specific population in this coming year, our members will pay nothing for drugs across all tiers. They will pay zero dollars as co-pays. And that is a huge, huge deal um, for our members. I love that. You know, uh, the Value-Based Insurance Design Center, which is out of Michigan, uh, that that founder, Mark Fendrick, was on the show <clears throat> about 18 months ago, maybe a year ago. So if you guys are not familiar with Value-Based Insurance Design and you want sort of a, or a refresher or 101, uh, go to Bright Spots in Healthcare, look up that episode with Mark Fendrick, Dr. Mark Fendrick. Uh, really good conversation with him uh, there. Uh, I, I, let's bring some of the case studies to, to life here. Uh, or let's actually, let me talk about the VA. Let's stay with the VB model for a moment, Tom. And what are some of the key levers when you think about valuation insurance design? What are the key levers that you're using to make sure that, that that whole approach is successful in the context of sort of medication management? Just like a big machine with gears, Eric, we need everything to work together, right? So um, we have a few different areas, especially within our care source team. We have an RX solution center in our pharmacy department. And this pharmacy team, very much like Molly described, we have pharmacists, we have farm techs, we have nurses, we have a variety of folks um, of different capabilities that are able to connect with members and not only connect with members, but escalate different issues. So as an example, Let's say that there's um, a prescription problem. They can connect with the physician. And um, we even have physician to physician escalations where we can um, improve the medical care of, of our patients. So this is absolutely critical. In this RX Solutions Center, it's very important to have a customer service outreach tracking module, very much like a CRM. And what this does, it allows you to get reports it allows everyone to see what the other person is doing so that care is fully coordinated. So this combined with the VBID free um, prescriptions that we give no co-pays to our members, it's been doing wonders for our patients. So you call it the solution center and it's an out that, that it's basically a mark and customer service outreach program. You got it. You got it. Anything that you didn't mention there, one or two levers there about the customer outreach program itself that is making it super successful that you could share? Yes, absolutely. Within this customer service solution, you have different levels, right? You have people who are going to directly connect with the members, um, and maybe they're, the, they're, they're not licensed pharmacists. However, the moment you, you need to escalate where there is a pharmacy-related issue, maybe they have a, um, a, a interaction with another drug or questions about the drug, you have the next layer where the pharmacists are able to give that direct medical feedback to the member, as well as um, include the rest of their um, care team as part of a, basically, I like to say hug the member, right? We basically surround the member with that love, that caring, so that we can make sure they take their drugs and prevent going into the hospital. And how are you identifying those members for outreach? Yeah, very good question. A lot of what this customer service outreach tracking module does, it shows who are unable to reach, who are the high risk members. We flag these members and these members, when they're flagged, we give them priority so we make sure that we can also identify how do they like to be contacted because some don't like being contacted by phone. Maybe they like it by email or by text. So looking at different modalities um, with a decent population, actually mail has actually been pretty beneficial for us, even sending postcards. And um, if we look at this multimodal approach, that's your key to success and not looking at it in just one lens. 
Great tee up. I, I want to get into, I want to stay on value-based care and I want to talk about complex members. And by the way, that very good question that you just complimented me on was actually a question from one of our audience. So I can't take credit for it. Uh, most of the good questions come from our audience. So I, I, I want to talk VBC, but before I do, I, I told you I was going to tell you a little bit more about seeing health. Can't do this show without partners like Scene. Uh, they are, again, a medication engagement company that is taking directly observed therapy to the next level through asynchronous video engagement. Their model of care is enhancing what the Centers for Disease Control already endorses the gold standard for ensuring medication adherence. And that's that DOT model, that directly observed therapy model. And they have a team of pharmacists, nurses, and health coaches that engage with members via back and forth videos uh, to build trust through person-to-person -person connections and empower every patient to take every dose of their medication properly. And they're not just talk. Seeing Health has been clinically validated, uh, has been clinically validated in over 20 peer-reviewed publications. There's already teaming up with Medicaid and Medicare plans, public health departments, and life science organizations to tackle a range of conditions from diabetes to asthma to sickle cell disease. So I'm gonna tee you up there, Sebastian. Uh, I want to talk about how a video strategy to adherence plays into a value-based care strategy. And then I have a follow-up around decent, mem decent members that come from one of our uh, audience members. So why don't we, we talk a little bit about how, how does this whole medication management, medication engagement strategy play into value-based care? Sure. So just um, forgetting about the video part for a second, um, you know, you've heard from Tom and Molly and Suzanne, a lot of infrastructure around making sure that the patient has everything they need to succeed. And that even gets to taking, from what I heard from Tom, taking costs off the table. Uh, and we know that in Medicaid, you know, co-pays are, are not really the issue um, when the medication's already been, um, you know, financed by the health plan. So generally speaking, not just um, not just for those on the call, but in general in healthcare, what we want to do is make sure that this these drugs, these medications, actually are are used by the patient to improve their health. Right, that's the point in the end. So all these delivery mechanisms are are wonderful, but we just have to make sure that we get the benefit of all the expense that goes into that. And so directly observed therapy is a value based strategy in general. You're, you're trying to make sure that the benefit of, you know, what the physician ordered is actually executed on by the patient. And it turns out there's a lot of barriers to, to doing that. And you're hearing a lot of these barriers be, be removed on, on the pharmacy side and on the virtual care side. Um, so what the, what the video can do, though, is when it comes to directly observed therapy, take away two barriers. One is obvious. It's geography. Live video does that. And the second is scheduling. Like, how do you have an appointment? When a patient's got three jobs and, you know, two or three kids and they're a single mom, how do you get that live video? You can't. So asynchronous video is actually very a very patient-centric approach to it. Um, sickle cell disease is a, you, you brought up sickle cell disease. It's a great example of a value-based approach just because, you know, patients with diabetes who don't take their medication, they're very expensive. But people with sickle cell disease, um, they can cost, you know, if you take a decent plan, uh, no one, for example, in Florida, a patient going to the hospital two or more times per year is costing $60,000 per year plus hydroxyurea as a medication um, really reduces uh, vaso-occlusive crises. And so, so it, it reduces hospitalizations by 30%. This is not magic. Like medications actually work if they're, if they're taken properly. So um, if you take just from the value-based perspective, there's a thousand members in this plan. If they get a hundred members to take their medication correctly, you're talking about savings of like of about one and a half million dollars a year right now projected for for 2024. So um, that and you you can take that same example to diabetes, like people who take their medication the right way every day consistently for for diabetes are going to cost thousands of dollars less. Um, so for I, I think it's it's really one of the lowest hanging fruits in in healthcare. And it's also great to see all this. Um, I think the the star metrics and you know the heatest metrics around getting people medication. I think we're starting to get to that point where you can actually um, work on now that last mile, which is helping people 
take that they take their medication correctly daily. So. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's a super great example. I, I can't remember in, in the piece that everyone requested, is that, is that story also in there with those results? I no, can't. We probably haven't published those, those yeah. results um, and need, need the, need our health plan partner to, uh, yeah, got to, to finalize, but we do yeah. have several, several other cases that are, that get more to fact that you can help people take a high percentage of it of their medication and when you measure that you're measuring on a daily basis how often do they take it and then you then you start to get to the heart of the matter as to as to whether these medications are actually doing what what we hope they'll do for the for the member yeah that's great i, I want i want to stick with strategy and i know suzanne uh for those of you who just joined us uh Su suzanne moxham is the director of quality for accreditation and government programs at Care First uh, down in the greater Baltimore area. We talked about refill coordination earlier, Suzanne. Now, I know that's part of a bigger comprehensive integrated medication engagement strategy that you have. So can you tell us a little bit more about the other key components that make your strategy successful beyond just the coordination of refills? Sure. So we do have an internal pharmacy team as well, like Molly described, but we also have been engaged with seen health for um, over or my whole time here, my two and a half years at Care First. So with that, it was really um, a, a great opportunity for us because one of the things involved in those and uh, in, in SEEN's program is a comprehensive medication review process that was not occurring for us in our Medicaid plan. Um, and during that process, we found, uh, you know, commonly that the uh, members were not receiving enough medications to control their chronic conditions. And then, you know, the outreach that SEEM does, the physician-to-physician -physician interaction to get those therapies and that, that medication uh, regimen reviewed and getting the right things prescribed to help improve the uh, management of the member's uh, chronic conditions. So I think that was uh, a really exciting opportunity for us to have that part occurring for the members because that was something that my internal pharmacy team was not able to take on just because of resources. So that was a great win for us. Um, and then on top of that, the the video strategy, um, and forgive me, I'll, I'll reference it this way, for those of us that have experience with like Weight Watchers, the accountability that comes with the video strategy and actually going and weighing in, those people have much better results than people that aren't participating. So it's the accountability, but it's the feedback that they're also getting and the support that they're getting from the care team and the staff at scene. And, you know, we see those videos um, we, it's done a great job to dispel some myths that we have. I call them like myth busting internal beliefs that we have where the members don't want to be, um, contacted frequently. And they have these great, um, I, I call them micro interactions. So they're getting that feedback. They're establishing relationships with this whole team that's supporting them through this program. And, you know, we survey, they survey the members, the feedback is great, uh, you know, and I think that it just goes to show that it's the type of interaction that they're doing, and it's something that is valuable to the members who are engaging with them. They're learning a lot. We know that you have to hear things a lot, uh, more than once for them to stick sometimes. So they're getting that feedback, and um, we see improvement in our outcomes, and not just the... Uh, A1C control, but the other parts of things that need to be done for members with diabetes, we're seeing that they are more compliant with their eye exams and they're more compliant with, um, you know, uh, just other, other items of care that they need. Um, so we do see a better rate of the people that participate in the program and have engaged in the program compared to those that haven't. So they do a better job. And as an interesting bonus, we're trying to drill down a little bit further. We're also seeing that they are utilizing the right care. They're having, they're receiving care at the right places. So they're not showing up in our ERs as much, and they are having those PCP visits. So it's, it's a really, um, it's really great when you can see the whole picture coming together. They're more compliant with all of the things that we need them doing, not just 
the medication. So the objective is the medications that we're seeing it across the board. So uh, I just don't want to make sure as people are take, hopefully taking notes and thinking about, OK, maybe we want to deploy some more medication engagement strategy uh, that you know, Care First, Blue Cross Blue Shield is deploying. Are you guys doing all of this in-house? Uh, there seems to be a lot of moving parts there. The pharmacist in-house, is the video uh, strategy in-house or are you using outside partners as well? T take us to how you build that. It's a mix. So we have some internal pharmacists. Uh, we have internal, uh, the internal med adherence team as well. Those are just the coordination of the refills. But for the video and the comprehensive medication review, we are using Scene Health. Um, so that's a vendor that relationship that we've had um, and has, that, that has uh, been in place and will continue with because it's delivering the results that we were looking for. Good. That would be awkward if you said otherwise right now, but that's great. <laughs> Uh, I guess it would. <laughs> so, so to that end, the results must be positive. Do you have any, could you share any of the results uh, or so quantitative or qualitative results so far? Sure. When I look at uh, the compliance of the members that completed the Seen Health program for di that were diabetics that we referred, um, they are, they have an improved A1C rate of just about four and a half percent compared to our total population. Um, we see them much more compliant. When I say more, I mean like, you know, almost 15 percent, almost 20 percent with eye exams and, you know, their KED screenings. They're, they are also, like I said, showing up less in, in the wrong places for care. They're not the wrong places, but in the places that they're in the right level of care for where we want them. So they're going to their PCP more or their specialist more and, and not landing in the ER like members who are not part of the program. So those are all really positive results for us. Um, Great. I, I, we're, on, we're on schedule. I see there's a lot of good questions in the queue. So I want to try to get to some of them as well. Uh, I, I want you, so Sebastian, I'm going to bring you back in because We've talked about medication engagement as part of enhancing and changing and basically reinventing DOT. But I'm just curious if we if we took DOT as an important component to a bigger strategy, uh, where does that fit in and how does sort of what you're doing with medication and engagement fit into the bigger picture of how health plans are probably thinking about connecting the member to the provider and the provider to the plan and, and the member back to the provider and the plan and all of that. Yep, so um, maybe an orientation for answering that question is just the, um, if you think about holistically, what do you need for a member to succeed on medication? You've got at least three major components and, and this is oversimplifying it, but, um, They've got, to, they've got to see a provider because otherwise they're not going to get prescribed medication. Um, they have to have lab results uh, in order for you to understand that they have a medication adherence problem. So for example, let's say A1C is out of control or um, viral load, it, you know, they're, they're not suppressed um, for hep C or, or HIV. So you need, you need a lab. And then finally, as we've heard, they need to have their medications. Um, and that that whole continuum, it's been called the cascade of care or securing it is called linkage to care. If you don't secure that, and you've heard a lot of strategies today to to secure that, then you are you at the end, it, it doesn't matter. you you don't you can't directly observe anything, right? There's nothing to observe. So it's important. and when you when you do do outreach to engage members, you have to meet them where they are, and it could very well be that. There's a, there's a uh, let's say, a, an asthma patient who doesn't have a controller. Well, what are you going to do? Say, sorry, you're disqualified for, from this program? No. Um, you're going to link them into a provider who can prescribe them or into a program to prescribe them a controller. Um, and, and so uh, along the way, if you're not, if you're not going upstream and um, fixing problems at their root cause and... Um, making these these linkages, you are not going to succeed with a medication adherence strategy, no, meaning taking a medication strategy like DOT, no matter how good it is. Uh, and, and I think um, to Tom's point, like CMS is your friend. I'd say this is the one place where the quality metrics are a great roadmap here. 
Look at diabetes. What does a patient with diabetes need to do according to HEDIS? Well, they need to get their blood pressure under control. They need to have a stat. Their A1C needs to be tested. It needs to be in control. Um, people who test twice per year, um, their A1C costs about $3,000 less every year, right? Than people who do not test their, their A1C. So um, in that regard, these quality metrics, which are intended to, you know, intended to give it the right incentives to health plans, they're actually a really, really nice roadmap for what we call at seeing what we call linkage to care, which we didn't invent. Like this is a concept that's been around for a very long time. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully that, that answers the question. It does. It does. I'm going to do this. Uh, so I'm going to bring back in Molly because I want to follow up to the Ask the Pharmacist program. And then I'm going to Go off script, folks, and I want to grab a couple of these questions that are really good from the audience, and then we'll get back on, hopefully, track with our time. So, Molly, we spoke a little earlier about the Ask the Pharmacist program and how it's been important to not only controlling costs, but it's been a contributor to UPMC's overall success. Uh, I have bragged on your behalf about the five stars. <laughs> how has the program been so successful? And if we were going to ask you, because okay, I know what people are thinking, because I've done this show for a long time. People are saying, oh, UPMC health plan, they've got inherited integrated vertical integration advantages over my health plan. So let's 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 move over to another market. And is there a blueprint we could provide everyone on the key four to five areas that would make an ask the pharmacist equally as scalable and successful in another market than Pittsburgh? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And I would think, I would say the things that have made the programs a success are the things I would recommend as your blueprint um, for building this program. The first is a dedicated team trained in motivational interviewing. This is something we believe passionately about. At onboarding, all of our pharmacists go through an intensive motivational interviewing course because if we're not engaging the members in you know, making it member centric, we're not gonna get them to take that medication. Um, and, and ultimately you gotta have a good team that's gonna be able to engage these members. Secondly is the digital platform. Um, the ability to A, have the member schedule um, when they identify issues on their end that they want to connect with someone is key, but also the ability for our pharmacist team to go ahead and convert members that we're talking to telephonically to a video approach as well. So having that flexibility in that scheduling platform. Next, I would say centralized scheduling. So across our health plan, if a member is calling into a health coach, if they're calling into member services, with specific medication or pharmacy related concerns, they all have the ability to promote that ask a pharmacist and get members scheduled on their behalf with a pharmacist on our team. And I think that's been really important for funneling members into our program. Marketing expertise has been vital for this program. You know, obviously we're promoting this for all lines of business, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial members, um, and we work really closely with that marketing team to make sure that the, that messaging is scaled to what we want to accomplish. You know, what is the call to action? Making sure that we are gearing towards those specific quality metrics as well, um, I would say is, is a big key factor for success with us. Lastly, warm transfers. So if a member is talking with a pharmacist on our team in a telehealth um, platform, we do have the ability to warm transfer in a behavioral health team, uh, urgent care, if, if their side effect is, is ongoing and acute and they cannot get in with the provider, we can connect them to an urgent care platform, a behavioral health uh, or a health coach right then and there as well. Okay, so if I'm tracking correctly, I think I am. I hope I am. We have a team trained, you, you invest in motivational interviewing, and these are your pharmacists we're talking about. Correct. We have a digital platform uh, that has flexibility uh, and, and allows sort of the whole program to run smoothly. You have a centralized scheduling process, which I'm sure a lot of organizations listening now probably have some sort of feature like that already. So they probably already have the ingredients in, in the cupboards. Right. Marketing expertise for outbound communication with uh, both uh, 
with the provider and your, and your members. And then finally, the ability to warm transfer mental health support uh, or get them to a virtual uh, urgent care kind of solution. Exactly. Great. All right. I want to I want to I want to ask you about social risks. Before I do, uh, along those lines, uh, I want to ask the group. I'm going to start with Sebastian, and then if anyone else wants to chime in, because this is really important when we talk about equitable access. What about health literacy and low English proficiency? This is asked uh, by one of our listeners here live, Suzanne. Thank you for this. Are you providing information on medication instructions in the patient's primary language? And how is this, if at all, improving medication adherence? So I'm going to start with Sebastian, because I'm thinking he'll have an answer to this. And then if people want to jump in, go ahead. Yeah, just quick background here. So um, we the, the, the first seen health application was actually launched by Hopkins um, researchers in 2008 in rural Uganda. And the first commercial use case when we started the when we spun the company out of Hopkins in 2014 was all public health departments where you have 66 percent um, non-native English speakers, recent immigrants. So the app was always intended for um, a non-English speaking population actually first. So of course the app's available in like 30 languages. Um, I would say that when it comes though to our virtual care team, uh, especially in Medicaid, Spanish is an absolute must. And um, being able to work with a uh, translation service to handle like localized issues, like for example, in Minnesota, Somali, um, often, you know, Vietnamese in, on the West Coast um, is, is very, very important. So, you know, you got, you've got two different components there. Technology is quite easy to organize according to, to, to patient language. Virtual care is a little bit different and more complex, um, but it is really, really critical to me to to try to engage the member in their in their language um, to the extent that you can. Anyone else want to jump on that with anything different than that? We have yeah, a Erica, Erica, I just want to add in. So when I led a plan here in California with a high Vietnamese and a high Khmer um, speaking population, um, a lot of Cambodian um, folks and. One of the biggest things we needed to do is hire a nurse and hire a coordinator that spoke Khmer, that understood the culture, so they can meet with them in person, but also speak to them in language, because there were a lot of um, literacy concerns, but also people were scared about even being approached. But the moment they heard their language, they connected right away. They connected. And once they connected, we were able to get them to start using their meds and help them to understand why they need to go out, pick it up and use those bands. And I know, you know, I know that there's a lot of uh, other social risks beyond just language. So, you know, when we're thinking about like, ask the pharmacist, you know, Molly, how are you guys at UPMHC working to mitigate those social risks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is well known that social risk factors in social determinants of health is a main barrier to medication adherence. So across all of our member interactions, we have embedded a social determinants of health assessment to better enable problem solving and triaging to both community and our health plan resources that we have. Um, we've also implemented several tools um, proactively to close the gap on health disparities in our interactions, you know, our daily interactions with members. Um, just to name a few of those, um, leveraging data sets that we have available, um, you know, to target and prioritize members that are high risk, you know, targeting, you know, race, ethnicity, language preferences, area deprivation index, in incorporating that into our programs personalizing and digitalizing our recommendations when that when applicable. Um, training our pharmacists not only in the motivational interviewing, but also in cultural humility. You know, that further enhances that motivational interviewing concept. Um, you know, we just talked about it a second ago. We've employed bilingual staff based upon our member mix. We have a, a good bit of our member population who are Russian, Ukrainian speaking. So we want to make sure that we're able to connect with those members as well. Um, participating in community events. We have a large team that's been able to go into the community setting and engage in face-to-face -face conversations with members. 
um, and, and engage with them, you know, from a social risk factor perspective as well. And the last thing I'll say is our collaboration with community partnerships in general, um, so that they can engage members from a social determinants of health perspective, screen them at the point of sale, and then also create those bi-directional pathways that they can refer back to us at the health plan perspective to coordinate and promote different resources on our end. That's great. It sounds that like, I'm always thinking about what's the next great show to provide value. I'm thinking cultural humanity as a way to forward your value-based care strategy. I, I'm already, so <laughs> give you credit for that. I, I want to get ready. I'm going to ask a couple of questions to all of you coming from the audience, but I want to, I, I don't want to miss this one. This was one that we already planned. Uh, Tom, you've been talking about value-based insurance design. You can't, We've talked a lot about what the plan's able to do. Pharmacists are on staff, but you, you can't do any of this without forging the right partnerships with the providers that don't work for you full time. So how are you guys at CareSource going about this? And, and how are you effectively making these partnerships work on, on speed uh, for your entire strategy? Absolutely, Eric, and you got it exactly right. Um, Med adherence really can't happen without the provider. The provider is the most key cog in this in um, helping patients to stay adherent. So it's so important we work with our provider groups because our provider groups have a lot of resources. They not only have physicians, they have pharmacists, they have support staff. And with this um, support, we can continue to circle the patient and provide them the care that they need. So with that, there are a few key areas that we can help with, um, with provider groups specifically. I like how Sebastian mentioned the CMS providing that framework when looking at A1Cs, looking at eye exams even, right? So it's so important that each provider group be given a regular scorecard. And what this regular scorecard has, it has your HEDIS measures. It has your Part D pharmacy measures. So that way they can see, oh, wow, we dropped from 95% to 91% between August and September. That helps us to put a flag, not just for us, but for that provider group as well, because that provider group does not want them going to the hospital either. But with that, not just a scorecard, we have to make it financially worth it for them, right? Because they're partners, but they have to pay rent. They have to pay their medical assistance. So it's important that when we look at value-based agreements, we, we look at a very comprehensive approach. We don't look at just HEDIS. We look at other things as well, too. When we can incentivize for med adherence, it's important that we do so that if we win, the provider wins. We win together. Let's say we get a four-star, a five-star, building that into the value-based model so that um, they can be, get remunerated for their hard work, just like that health plan. And then finally, very important, having a regular connection with a pharmacist contact in that group. A lot of the sophisticated groups have a pharmacist on staff that can work med adherence, that works closely with the providers in their group. If they do not have a pharmacist, they usually have a chief medical officer, a medical director, that if you're able to connect with them, one, you can connect with, with, um, with that medical group at a, at a medical level so that you have a like um, physician or pharmacist talking to like physician or pharmacist, but then we can collaborate different programs. So if the medical group is doing programs and the health plan is doing programs, we can now talk and make sure we don't step over each other's toes, but we can coordinate efforts so we can better surround the patient with support. Is that pharmacist uh, a care source pharmacist or someone that sits within the network or medical group? Good question, Eric. That's someone who sits within the medical group someone who is employed by the medical group, and we have a pharmacist from CareSource connecting with that pharmacist in that medical group. Okay, so I'm going to summarize this. Regular scorecards, because you can't manage what you don't measure. It seems like such a cliche, but boy, it's so true. That's just how we operate. Fitbit just changed their interface 
And I used to have daily and weekly goals. You don't see the weekly goals as much. And I'm following, I noticed just recently, like three straight weeks, I've fallen below my weekly goals for steps uh, because it's just, I don't, I don't measure it now. Cause so you have to measure uh, if you want to manage uh, financial models that make it worth it, incentives that make it worth it for both sides. And then the third is regular connections with the pharmacist, a pharmacist contact in the group. Those are the three things, correct? That's it. That's it. Okay. I, I want to go through, I'm, I'm going to do a jump ball. Well, I never do a jump ball. So I, I, here's what we're going to do. First, I have a question for Suzanne, and this is a quick one, Suzanne. So just to rewind, we were talking a bit about this integrated medication engagement strategy. You talked about medication reviews. You talked about a video strategy, uh, and then you sh you talked a little bit about the results uh, as we have a attendee asking you how many members were involved in the, res the results that you shared. If you, if you have that, you may not. And what was the length of time for those results? You're, I think you're on mute, Suzanne. I sure am. There's always that one person. We the results were for almost went the hallway, 56 <laughs> minutes. I'm usually the one. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, um, it was for measurement year 2022 and um dean was I, I i don't i don't have the exact number of members in that panel um okay i can i can it, but i, I knew i knew we put you on the spot but it seemed like a pretty simple question to take a swing at so i wanted to yeah. be, uh, go there all right so we were talking a bit this is going to be this is to any of the panelists Sebastian, I'm going to have you start because I know you wrote a partial answer to this. So I know I'm not going to totally get stuck and then anyone who wants to jump in can. Here's the question. Particularly with complex and low income members, how do you handle situations where members' prescription dosages have changed? Maybe the doctor decided to lower the dose from where they started, for example, and the member refuses to fill it. Thinking about the impact for STARS adherence measures, especially now that we're in Q4 and the measurement year, how are you guys thinking about that? So Sebastian, I'll start with you. Then if anyone else wants to jump in, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, I know that there are a lot of strategies out there for, for hitting these um, three very heavily weighted star measures. Um, we're, we're really, where we do very well are, are those members that are having a lot of trouble because we're, our job is to get to the root cause. And sometimes that getting to that root cause is with a pharmacist to understand on the phone what's actually happening. You have to have the time, you have to dedicate the time to do to understand what is the, the reality here of the situation. Sometimes directly observed therapy then can be help can can help then really get to the heart of the matter of what's happening. Um, so I think in, in the end, what the things that we're talking about today are giving the member the time they need to express what it is that's bothering them. It could be that the dosage is incorrect and that they're, they've are they stopped the medication because of side effects. Um, it could be that they are taking the wrong one, right? That they're, they thought that this bottle was this medication and they're actually taking it and it's, it's incorrect and you might not know that till you see it. So I think um, separating those members out population health-wise that you can do like a, a blast big phone campaign to to refill their meds and do all the other things you heard about and then isolating that one population is going to be really hard to handle and taking a, a more differentiated, more white glove approach in a way. Um, I think also Suzanne's got probably some great answers that the Weight Care First does population health management and separates cohorts and designs strategies outside of just um, medication related to get to transportation needs, to get to food insecure, et cetera. Um, you know, that's a it's a it's a really great pop health approach that cuts across the various barriers to uh, to adherence. I am looking at the clock. I am hesitant to ask another question because I am very sensitive to everyone's calendar. Uh, so I am going to close up shop right now and thank you all for all the hard work and time uh, you dedicated to preparing for today and the hour you just took. So I thank you, the four of you. You were terrific. I, I want to also extend a really special thank you to all of you who are watching live, uh, listening via podcast. It's an incredible privilege to fit into your busy calendar. And I hope uh, this episode helped provide you with some insights and made the time well spent for you. I really hope you use these bright spots shared to inspire 
your thinking and maybe enhance your company's current approach to medication adherence and medication engagement at your organization and improve your entire value-based care strategy. We produce this show for you. Provide us that feedback and that survey I just sent you, please, because we want to continue to provide valuable content for you. This is your Bright Spots in Healthcare podcast. Take care, everyone.